Make Real specializes in creating immersive learning solutions across a range of technologies. To download their latest academic paper on how to turn learners into activists, visit makereal.co.uk slash activists. Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. In this highly acclaimed series, Professor Donald Clark, internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode explores the impact of what has been called the most important idea in human history, Darwin's theory of evolution. A powerful idea, still to this day controversial in some quarters, its impact was felt far beyond the natural sciences where it was first formulated. But what did it mean for learning? So welcome to this episode of Great Minds on Learning on evolutionists. In Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, the Victorian poet invites his beloved to come to the window and hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. It's actually a poem animated by a sad sense of lost sentences. He writes, Sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. What caused all this despair, Donald, and the (laughs) corrosive pessimism that seems to afflict so many late Victorians from Arnold through to Hardy and so on? I see you you English, uh, John, you're such romantics. (laughs) 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 It's it's a great poem, obviously, Uh, just listening to you recite it there. Of course, I'm actually sitting in Scotland at the moment, which is a very different place with regard to the romanticism. Uh, but uh, it was here, strangely, that, you know, if you look at... I now live in Brighton like you, and if we look upon those beautiful white white cliffs, as the white cliffs of Dover in this case, that uh, Matthew Arnold was talking of. But James Hutton up here in Scotland, was who was called the father of geology, that's the late 18th century, when we, you know, during the Enlightenment, who knew David Hume and Adam Smith and so on. And of course, it was him who really punctured the, the romantic dream of the landscape, as it were, uh, by finding out that the earth wasn't, as Bishop Usher famously said, just 4,000 years old, based on scripture, the Bible. Uh, it was actually, he discovered deep time. In other words, the rocks were like a book you could read, showing that uh, time was without bound, almost endless. He, it was so deep he couldn't calculate it in his famous book, uh, uh, The Theory of the Earth. And then another uh, geologist, Charles Lyell, comes along and writes, uh, a, a, a reframes the whole science of rocks, the cliffs of Dover, as it were, and uh, writes a book called The Principles of Geology, which Darwin takes on the voyage of the Beagle and regards as a masterpiece. And so the, it had already been in the air, the sense of deep time, the idea that uh, uh, the landscape is not what you think it is. It's much older, more ancient, and came long before us as a species. And then interestingly, down in Brighton, I gave a talk recently on this in one of those salons about a guy, a local guy called Gideon Mantell in Brighton. Oh, Gideon Mantell, yes. Yes, and uh, interestingly, you know, he he was fundamental in this as well. So in our area, in those Cretaceous chalk cliffs, as it were, he found fossils and uh, more importantly, found the fossils of an iguanodon, a a, a dinosaur. So this was the first species in the world puzzled, well, what is this creature now dead? An extinction comes into play. The notion that a species is not immutable forever, God created, but something that may die off, as it were. And this opens up the whole world of science and of course prepares the ground for Darwin. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you've got, I mean, in a sense, Arnold's (laughs) peplish, Pessimism, if you want to call it that, is it's the sort of dying embers of romanticism, the notion that we are special and that the world is created for our, uh, you know, that Victorian idea that it's an aesthetic spectacle <laughs> yeah. created by God for, for we as a species. That was then blown out the water, uh, I would say. So interesting way to start. So the end of human exceptionalism. 
if you want to yeah, call it that, that way. Yeah, that would be a good way of putting it. That's exactly yeah. what it was, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's very interesting, Donald, what you say, but I think if anyone is going to get the blame, <laughs> it seems that Charles Darwin, although he would have been appalled to have been thus charged, but most modern scholars do, if not explicitly, pin the blame on him for this uh, late Victorian pessimism and his pesky theory of evolution with the publication of his great work on the origin of species and its acceptance by the establishment more importantly really, it became increasingly difficult to maintain the literal truth of the bible that with the geological evidence as you say as well and in the process christianity lost a lot of its hold over the hearts and minds of the educated um you know evolution became a kind of science in fact the whole of science became an acid bath for Christianity. And in the process, many would say, human thought took a great leap forward. The literal truth of the Bible did continue to be asserted, however, notably in the Scopes trial of 1925, which we'll talk about later, and does so to this day. Uh, we still have bishops and in the Lords and a, an established church in this country, and I'm not going to talk about the states. But the theory of evolution nevertheless remains a pillar of contemporary thought, influencing not only many branches of science, but also politics, art, society in general. Donald, we covered some pretty major figures in our journey so far and some world changing trends in thought. But how does this one, evolution, which has been called the most important idea in human history by Melvin Bragg, affect how we should look at the theory of learning? Yeah, you're right. It's this, I mean, it's hard to underestimate how important this theory was. You know, the, the Daniel Dennett wrote a whole book, you know, called Dan, uh, uh, Darwin, called Darwin's Dangerous Idea, the most dangerous idea ever, you know, and perhaps, arguably, I think the most important scientific idea our species has ever uncovered. Uh, you know, and you said this great leap forward. It's an interesting phrase there because, you know, this is 1859 after the Industrial Revolution when the Romantics were sort of, you know, like looking at that with some suspicion, perhaps rightly. But the great leap forward, you know, in 1903, we, we the Wright brothers, take a little aeroplane and fly off and within 60 odd years where we have a man on the moon. <laughs> you know, this led to a scientific revolution. It wasn't just the uncovering or the repositioning of us as a species as just another animal which is important but darwin uh, you know sets the scene for a great leap forward which was the the phrase you mentioned there and of course it was this notion that there is no god there is no maker you know there is no creator uh, like paley's watch you know paley comes across a watch on the beach and he goes this must have been made by something that's so complicated and applies that to the nature or the world of nature he sees but along comes darwin and uh, of course famously uh, described by Richard Dawkins as the blind watchmaker, as at work here, the accident of genetic change, of variation through sexual selection, and the the famous phrase "survival of the fittest." So, uh, you know, we science then suddenly becomes more important than religion, as more explanatory power than religion. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so I, you know, I think that sets the scene for the whole learning theory thing as well you know the the this notion that the, the the mind was not god created it's not a tabla rasa as Locke said which you write things upon when you're teaching or learning you know it's not a blank slate uh, it's actually an evolved organ <laughs> this is a, this is such a momentous shift in terms of the way you look at teaching and learning and no one mm -hmm. takes it seriously enough i think uh, because you have this shift away from seeing the brain and the mind as a given entity, tabula rasa, towards something that's actually quite flawed, that had evolved for entirely different purposes to those we're trying to achieve through education and degrees and university and so on. In other words, the brain becomes a rather odd organ. <laughs> you know, it has all these structures that were evolved for an entirely different context than learning mathematics, physics, or studying English literature or whatever. It's an evolved organ. I'm beginning to get a real sense of, of why this is so important. So let's get into the weeds. Let's first look at the man himself, Darwin. Give his dates, 1809 to 1882. He was an English naturalist, geologist, and biologist. In, in, in a sense, he created the field of biology. 
He was born into money, the hunting, fishing, shooting classes, and he didn't mind shooting things, and once um, accidentally ate one of his specimens for dinner. But with an important ancestry from our point of view, in that both his grandfathers, Erasmus Darwin and Josiah Wedgwood, were members of the Lunar Society, which we covered in our episode on the Enlightenment. So it came from this Enlightenment background, an enlightened background. He initially studied to be a doctor at the University of Edinburgh, but neglected his studies, wasn't interested in that, and transferred to Christ College, Cambridge, where his interest in natural history really blossomed. His actual course of study might have led to him becoming an Anglican parson, Anglican country parson with a side interest in butterflies. But he was nuts about botany and entomology, and beetles in particular. I mean, this is a real facet of Darwin's character that he was so interested in going out to the field, catching the insects, um, keeping them, cataloguing them and systematizing their differences. Um, he, he was a real empiricist, uh, which is something we've celebrated in, in these programs so far. Um, instead of taking up orders, he signed up as a sort of trainee naturalist and gentleman's companion on the HMS Beagle and the rest is history, pretty well known history. I'm going to assume, so it probably doesn't need retelling. His proposition that all species of life had descended from a common ancestor is now generally accepted and considered a fundamental concept in science. Donald, a big idea like evolution is necessarily going to affect a, as wide and capacious as the theory of learning, but there is something more specific about the theory of evolution, how it relates to learning that we need to pay attention to, isn't there? Yeah. I think that's right. You were right. I mean, there is Dar Darwin wasn't a learning theorist as such, but boy, did he apply rigor to his own learning, his recommendation that the data really matters, yeah. the, the, the basis of empiricism, really, and that you form hypotheses, but you really have to test them against what you see in the real world or through experimentation and come to sound conclusions based on that data and logic. So, and, you know, it's somebody who was, I think he was in the Beagle for five years and took him another 20 years to write, uh, uh, you know, uh, write the famous book. So uh, he was laborious, meticulous, a real genius of a man. But there's a, uh, you rightly ended there, you know, what, what is it that he gives us in terms of learning theory? What gift does he hand over? And I think the big one is reframing the brain, the limitations of the brain, seeing it as an evolved organ. And there's some really concrete things here that I think anybody who teaches or is involved in learning should be possibly aware of, really. Uh, but I'm not too sure that it's taught in any serious sense, but that's what we'll tackle today. So the brain is an evolved organ. What does that mean? Well, the first thing is this sort of thing we discussed in a previous podcast, and that's the limitations of working memory. There's a good reason we have a limitation of working memory, so that sensory overload doesn't happen. You know, it's like a, it's like pouring some, it's like pouring milk out slowly rather than just glugging the whole, the whole bottle onto your plate or uh, into a glass. Working memory means you can only hold three or four things in your mind at one time to manipulate them, like numbers. Uh, you have this sort of 20 seconds of attention as we sweep through time, through sensory memory. So it's very, very limited uh, working memory. And uh, this is the problem that almost anybody who teaches or learns has. Okay. Then we have a uh, long-term memory. Now, you might think that long-term memory is a solution to that problem where we just shove stuff into long-term memory and recall it when we want. But again, evolution has played a funny trick there. Evolution has meant that long-term memory is not like the digital memory of your computer, perfect recall. It actually reconstructs memories when they come back into the brain because they have to be useful to you, whatever, you know, whether you've been hunting something down or being hunted, the sort of predator or prey, uh, fight or flight instincts we have. So even long-term memory and even episodic versus semantic memory, it's quite clear that episodic memory came first in our evolution and is primary. This notion that we remember, you know, almost incidents or it's almost like the replay of video in some sort of way, mm -hmm. as opposed to the recall of, let's say, Matthew Arnold's poem, uh, Dover Beach, which is semantic memory. That came much, much later. So in teaching and learning, you have to be very aware of episodic memory and not, and not rely wholly and utterly on semantic memory because it's so difficult to learn and retain stuff. And of course, there are other features of the brain that are just so obviously evolved and flawed, uh, apart from the memory stuff. You know, we do, even in memory, we get dementia and Alzheimer's. We, you know, Alzheimer's, we all start to forget more stuff as we get older, as we both know, John. You have this big emotional surge in the reptilian yeah. brain, as it were, that's clearly an evolved 
issue, which is a big deal in learning. We did a whole podcast on emotions in learning. Yeah. We're also inattentive. We have all these weird biases, which are also a feature of our evolved, evolved minds or brains. We can't download our network from other people. And then we die. <laughs> it dies because we as a species are so limited that eventually we have this uh, four score years and 10 and that's it. Unlike, uh, you know, technology, which can go on forever, as it were. So this notion that, that Darwin really uncovers, that the brain is an evolved organ, has massive implications because we reframe the whole problem around how do we overcome the problems that an evolved brain has when we teach someone or when we learn. And that's why Darwin is so important. And it's interesting what you what you're saying there holds holds the key perhaps to why human progress often seems so two steps forward, one step back. In that uh, the the origins of the way that our brains evolved will force us back to uh, to to to. I'm I'm struggling not to use the word primitive because it's a pejorative, but but to an earlier stage of of um, how we apprehended the the situation around us. I'm I'm kind of trying rather clumsily to lead you into talking about the scopes trial here because that, right. that's an interesting example of the interaction between education and evolution yeah the, i mean the scopes trial was that you know whenever you get this new paradigm shift in science or in technology or whatever you get that friction you know almost like the two tectonic plates rubbing each other causing some sort of volcanic activity and the scopes trial was the volcano that that, remember Darwin's Darwin writes his book in 1889, but yeah. still, you know, huge swathes of the the world were it's still creationists essentially. And let's not fool ourselves. We, you know, evolution is not well received in Islam and uh, and in hardcore Christianity. It is still regarded as heretical uh, and against scripture and so on. But the Scopes trial comes along. So it shows you how late this is. That's 19. 19- 25, 1925, yeah. people are still th- are still arguing as to whether Darwin should be taught at all in schools in the US. It was the famous Butler Act. And then along comes this teacher, John Scopes. He was almost an, an innocent abroad because he just refused to comply with the Butler Act. You know, he just refused to, to, to teach the biblical stuff without teaching evolution at the same time. Actually, he hadn't actually taught evolution at all. He just thought it was plainly ridiculous that one shouldn't. So... And in actual fact, the trial is really interesting, the Scopes trial, because he, he didn't win it. The, the lawyers didn't win it for him. He was sort of released on a technicality. And so even then in 1925, uh, it, it was the technicality was some something odd about the fine that the judge had set, you know. And, and in fact, that law, the Butler's law, Butler's law, wasn't repealed, was not repealed until 1967. And it's still an issue that's alive and kicking in the American school system where that sort of Puritan, hardcore, fundamental Christianity is still alive and well. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really until 1958 that national defense education, like this, we're talking about the US here, I think, yeah. very, very different in Europe, I think, it led to, that, led to the, the law that textbooks, which had previously excluded evolution, amazingly, uh, suddenly had a definitive framework for, for the, uh, with the biological sciences in which evolution could fit. So I think, finally, education, you know, education is a very slow learner <laughs> because mm-hmm. it was often defined by politics, especially in the US, our cultural beliefs. But this fundamentalism versus science uh, is around. But of course, creationism is still alive and well. Uh, but who, who can... Who can deny that Darwin, in the end, has won out? The new scientific paradigm is most certainly evolution because it has such powerful explanatory uh, and predictive power in evolutionary psychology, I think, which we'll talk about. But also the evidence is just incontrovertible. It's in those rocks beneath our feet. Uh, It's in our genes. It's in the very nature of our evolved learning brains. They don't come much better known than Darwin, but our next theorist is someone completely at the other end of the fame scale, so to speak, which can be a bit arbitrary. It's quite possible that very few of our listeners uh, will ever have heard of him. I certainly hadn't. And yet you say, Donald, that he may be one of the most significant learning theorists ever. James Mark Baldwin, 
born 1861, died 1934, so spanning the 19th and 20th centuries, was a philosopher and psychologist born in South Carolina and educated at Princeton. He was one of the founders of the Department of Psychology at Princeton and the University of Toronto, having studied at Leipzig with William Wundt, the first person ever to call himself a psychologist. So we're kind of back to um, the, the the time when we were talking about Pavlov and the and, and the, the origins of, of psychology as a, a discipline. And Wundt, of course, one of the fathers of modern psychology. Um, Baldwin did his bit to spread this into uh, the US and, of course, Canada, part of that time of the... British Empire, so to speak. Where Baldwin figures in the story of evolution is through something called the Baldwin effect. Now, Donald, I had a certain amount of difficulty getting my head around this while researching for the episode. So I'd ask that you explain it right. Well, you know, and if I've got difficulty, I'm not that bright, but a lot of people out there are probably the same as me. I'd ask that you explain it rather slowly and carefully for the listeners, <laughs> because it really is important for the picture we're building up here of Darwinism and its effect on learning. The Baldwin effect, Donald. Okay, the Bold and I'm a huge fan of uh, James Baldwin, and I, I do think he is one of the most significant learning theorists in the whole 200 odd that we're covering in these podcasts, John. Uh, because well, he, you rightly said he was a psychologist, and he does something uh, quite interesting. He takes learning as a concept and puts it into evolutionary theory as a sort of you know like a caveat almost, or contributes to evolutionary theory post Darwin. And so the Baldwin effect itself is, I mean, it's fairly simple when you, when you, when you, it's one of those click things. Once you get it, you get it. The idea is that we have learning brains. Okay. So we have learned the behavior. A uh, most hardcore evolutionists would say it's only your genes. And then the effect, which selection, namely breeding uh, has sexual selection that creates a, a new set of genes, some of which can be damaged or changed. The, uh, and so within this panoply of variation, the, those that survive and go on to breed more people take those genetic traits with them. So in a sense, the body is just a vehicle for your genetics. But okay. along comes Baldwin. And this is not Lamarckianism. So Lamarck claimed that acquired characteristics, in other words, uh, you know, the giraffe has a long neck because it's constantly stretching up to the leaves and then mm. that just gets somehow captured the genetics and carried on to the next. So giraffe's necks get longer and longer. This is not what Baldwin is talking about. So let's focus on the word learning for a minute, okay? So what he says is that there's some people genetically may be just better at learning. You know, you suddenly you have a gene that makes your memory or working memory slightly better. And that uh, that clearly has happened in evolution because... Uh, semantic memory has developed, different types of memory have developed to cope with different circumstances. So there are these opportunities where genetics creates the learning brain, but the learning itself creates these conditions for survival and therefore breeding and therefore the carrying on of whatever genetic legacy you've got, okay? So this places learning into this bigger canvas of evolution Okay, and Daniel Din it, it, it described it as a skyhook. It's a funny sort of thing. You know, it's this little pool of activity where if you learn enough, you increase your ability to find a good mate, and therefore your genes are more likely to survive than a non-learning person yeah. <laughs> or who hasn't adapted through learning. So learning suddenly becomes an incredibly important sort of phenotype feature mm -hmm. that helps you in the process of sexual selection to get on in the world or kill more, uh, you know, kill more uh, uh, mammoth than, uh, you know, pink caves or, you know, so you can see how all these other features of evolutionary psychology that, that people uh, have written so eloquently about suddenly become incredibly important. Status, but you might learn to become a more status-orientated person. Uh, all sorts of odd things in our culture seem to be explained by this. So the Baldwin effect is, is that concept that there is more to evolution than just this genetic killing people and not killing them and your speed and your particular gene surviving and your gene pool uh, moving forward in that trajectory. There are these opportunities where learning comes in and shapes evolution quite cleverly. But to be clear, it's not the content of what you learn. It's kind of the, 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 the mental system, the, the, the learning muscle. Yeah. So it can actually evolving. be two things. That's, that's a very good question. It's the, the sort of learning muscle. Yeah. So if you suddenly genetically have this little capacity to learn better, 
that mm-hmm. gives you significant advantage in terms of your ability to breed. <laughs> right. uh, so that's one aspect. But of course, the content comes in there because it might be the fact that, uh, you know, 50,000 years ago, you were particularly good at spotting the anatomical features of, uh, of a lion and that you learned to paint a lion beautifully on the caves uh, uh, in Chauvet, and that gives you a huge status as an artist, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. Uh, so... It, it sometimes can be content. It's sort of tied up with content in a way, but you learn the learning of content that gives you the advantage that allows you to your genes to continue. It's quite a subtle thing in many ways, but quite obvious when you get it that the, this may very well be quite important. That learning, in particular, because that's basic to everything, it's basic to all cognition, as it were. May there, there are of course things that you know, like physical strength that obviously evolution has shaped. Yeah, uh, the physiology of people, but it would be bizarre if it hasn't shaped cognition. It shaped the bodies and the shapes we have, but it didn't shape cognition. That would be totally bizarre. And of course, uh, as we know, it it did shape cognition. Now, the the Baldwin effect itself has had a big resurgence. Aldous Huxley himself, uh, and uh, uh, believed that it, it was right as a theory, and then it's had a, a second life because Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who's a very famous machine learning, the guy who invented machine learning, really, reinforcement learning and so on, those people have started to look at that theory and see it. There's a funny thing in AI, which is evolutionary or genetic algorithms. These are algorithms that breed and produce more options, and they've been used in learning. I'm working on a big project where evolutionary algorithms are producing lots of potential pathways for learners, depending on their progress. And so it rec- the next thing they recommend is the optimal, almost genetic pathway in learning for them. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're quite powerful, these algorithms. So it's had a second life through AI. Daniel Dennett was a big fan of them. So uh, in, in his book, Consciousness Explained, and also in uh, you know, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, those two books, he describes Baldwin's theory as a sky crane, this sort of thing, that our brains hook, almost hook them, have these sky cranes which are unsupported, you know, it's like they hang in the air, but they pull us forward. In other words, our ideated or learning is a mental act, as it were, but it's incredibly powerful in terms of giving us some evolutionary advantage. And you have people, there are a whole stack of books now, you know, Evolution and Learning was one, uh, that's the, the, the sort of reappraisal of the Baldwin effect by way of Ndepu. So there are a number of books here that are out showing that this was indeed powerful. And it's central to learning. The, just to repeat myself a little bit, this puts mm-hmm. learner, learning center, center stage in the evolutionary process. And some people, Deacon, Deacon actually thinks that the Baldwin effect is responsible for this real acceleration or rapid progress, specifically in language, mind and language, if you put the two together. Because that puzzles people. How did the language come about? It suddenly comes from nowhere, you know? But it's yeah. clearly, you know, an amazing phenomenon. No other species really has. They're very primitive signaling as opposed to language. But uh, some people think it was just one genetic click. That's the evidence doesn't seem to support that. It seems as though something else is at work, and Deacon thinks it's the Baldwin effect. Okay, yeah. and we'll talk more about language a bit later with our yeah, sure. Next, but one theorist. Oh, I'd say one thing, and there's an interesting thing about Baldwin, is that in evolutionary terms, this is true of Darwin as well, there's something very odd about this. Evolution has produced these brains, which eventually evolved to such a state that they then self-discovered the process by which the brain was created. You know, I always find that an astonishing thing. You know, yeah. that the Baldwin effect and Darwin, effectively through, the, or through the, or the own efficacy of the brain, they created the, they created the theory whereby the brain came to its own proof for its own evolution and existence. <laughs> what do we call that? Metacognition? Yeah, the, the sounds the, a bit meta. Yeah, the metacognition is that notion that we then became we then become aware of how to best use our own brains. It's a very mm-hmm. self-reflective organ, as we're doing this morning. You know, it's a it's an amazing fact that the brain itself came to realize how it came about. <laughs> it's, it also blows, literally blows my mind when I think about that concept, but that's exactly what evolution says happened, and uh, I'm a believer, of course. But... We're fast-forwarding to our own century now for our next two theorists, who are contemporaries of you and I, Donald. Uh, hashtag OK Boomer. Perhaps. 
David C. Geary, born 1957, still among us, is a cognitive developmental and evolutionary psychologist born in Rhode Island, currently a curator's professor and Thomas Jefferson fellow in the Department of Psychological Sciences and Interdisciplinary Neuroscience Program at the University of Missouri. Clearly, I'm not very well evolved to deal with these job titles. <laughs> did his university learning on the West Coast at Santa Clara, California State University at Hayward, the Mental Research Institute in Palo Alto, and the University of California, Riverside. He has wide ranging interests that take him into fields like anthropology, biology, behavior genetics, computer science, education, government, mathematics, neuroscience, physics, and psychology, busy guy. But our interest in him today is to do with the way we learn and how it's been shaped by millions of years of evolution, an evolutionary psychologist. If you've ever wondered why some things are easy to learn, other things are hard, this is your guy. Donald, tell us about him. Yeah, the, so we've been talking in general terms about evolution and the Baldwin effect, but suddenly, you know, there has been intense reflection on how that affects learning. And Geary is your go-to man on this, who writes the book, The Origin of the Mind, and... 2005, so that's 15, 16, 17 years ago, but that's the go-to text on this, you know, and he asks a very simple question, why are some things really easy to learn, like the recognition of faces and, you know, walking and even language, it's, it's like falling off a log, really, uh, it's almost not formally taught. Uh, well, your first you know. language is, uh, learning yeah. other languages when you're older is extremely difficult. Indeed, and that, in fact, his theories explain why that is so, Uh because you're more receptive at a very young age in terms of the plasticity of your brain and so on. But, uh, you know, that's right. That, that's right. It's a good, a good example uh, of Geary's explanatory and prophetic power. But the book itself says there's stuff that's easy, stuff that's hard. The stuff that's easy, he calls primary biological learning. The stuff that's hard, that's, he calls secondary biological learning. And that's because we really evolved to learn the primary stuff. So what is that primary stuff? The primary biological learning, that's how, that's how he described it. That's all your sort of folk knowledge and all the sort of abilities you have as a young child. We've just mentioned language. So you learn to speak and hear your parents, your friends and other people almost automatically. You know, in fact, you know, if you're the child of an immigrant, you actually pick all this stuff up from your peer group automatically. You're not taught by your parents at all. You just like naturally pick it up and you speak the accent and language of your peer group. So primary biological knowledge has a whole lot of competencies from the evolved cognitive domain. And they're really easy. You don't really have to teach them much. The really interesting thing is all the stuff that's hard. And that's almost everything you come across in school, university, or academic education. That's the knowledge and abilities that are acquired through a combination of formal and informal learning, you know, through education and so on. Uh, so primary learning is stuff we're primed to learn. It's really easy, to, but that's the foundation. The primary stuff is the foundation for secondary learning. Without primary learning, it's an important point, you don't have secondary learning. You need to, and this is what teachers and learners even have to be aware of, that you build upon the, and Pinker does this, we'll come to this uh, later, yeah. but. Uh, you have to be very aware of what primary learning is to be successful in secondary learning. Uh, because if you leave children to their own devices, for example, that Rousseauian idea, oh, just let them thrash around, as it were, or put them in school, just let them play. Play is important, but they're likely to stay within their primary learning mode then. You know, they stay within primary learning. They'll learn to, they will learn to, to speak and to listen, but they won't learn to read and write on their own without help because that's secondary learning. It's a nice distinction there between speaking, listening, reading, and writing. That's primary. This is secondary. And of course, most education and training is secondary learning. It's, it's doing the things that are really quite difficult to do. Now, there, to get well, more detail on that, what, what is this primary stuff? Because some of it is just plain wrong. The danger is that we have evolved brains that have evolved to be quite sort of folkish. And the uh, Geary calls it folk psychology, folk biology, and folk physics, you know? In other words, if you ask somebody who hasn't been to school uh, about psychology, so there's some primary stuff that's true. For example, we we are born with the ability to recognize human faces and remember them. That's just clearly a facility we have and we're born with. It's innate. We also have an assumption that others have minds. Sounds a bit odd, but actually it's yeah. something the brain has to know, that I, Donald, need to know that, John, you have a brain and a mind like mine so we can communicate. 
for example. We also have the, an innate recognition of kin, people who look like us in our own family. Uh, and then a recognition of people outside that group. Now, all this stuff is sort of innate. Uh, you know, it's not the tabula rasa or blank slate that we learn this stuff. It's all socially conditioned. We don't learn that primary stuff, according to Geary and Pinker and most people in, in, in serious science. And that has to be replaced. Some of that stuff has to be put to one side, you know, because it can be dangerous. For example, sexism and racism. If you have an innate fear of people outsiders, then that can lead to extremes of racism. Or if you have innate aggression, for example, which might be a good thing in the savannah, but it's not such a good thing in a modern urban city where you have to get on with people. So sometimes the primary stuff has to be repressed or reprogrammed. Now, re-educated, sounds like a terrible term, but in folk <laughs> biology, for example, we also, really interesting stuff here discovered, but there are all sorts of really good academics in this field who show that we actually have almost an innate ability to separate animate from inanimate objects in the world. Flora from fauna, What's yeah. good for us, possibly dangerous. You know, we know a snake's dangerous when we see it. Yeah, what's that moving in the bushes? That's right. And then that, the, those bad smells normally indicate foods that are going to be incredibly bad for you if you eat them, for example. Likely mm. predators and prey and things in the environment are going to harm us, you know. So we have a sort of folk biology around that. Uh, and then we also can read similarity across species and all sorts of things there. Folk physics is the really interesting one for me, though. So Geary explains, we know this, that when, you know, when a child sees someone shoot an arrow or a cannonball, they think that the impetus is somehow in the cannonball, you know, that the arrow has its own sort of impetus that flies it through the air. This is yeah. very, very common and almost universal amongst people who have not been taught proper physics. And we didn't really know this until Newton comes along. Mm -hmm. So one of Newton's three laws says, well, that's wrong. You know, if you're in, this, in space and you suddenly, you know, press a button in your space suit and get you propelling forward, you will go on ad infinitum until another force stops you. <laughs> this is completely counterintuitive. It mm. doesn't happen on Earth because of friction. But, you know, of course, the arrow has no such thing as impetus or momentum, that, that idea, you know. Once a force has been applied to it, it will go on ad infinitum until something else stops it. It eventually falls to the ground because of another force, that namely gravity or hits a body or a wall. So physics is the one area where we have to be taught to get rid of our primary learning, as Geary would call it, in order to understand things like uh, uh, centrifugal forces or flight. You know, when you look up at that aircraft and see it take off, you know, the, those huge aircraft at Gatwick or Heathrow, you go, how on earth is that thing just hanging in the air like that? And of course, it's, that's because our brains have evolved to think that that is odd. Whereas if you understand the physics, then you will understand the Bernoulli effect and so on, and how lift applies in, uh, on the wings of aircraft and so on. So, is, yeah. Yeah, I think you get the idea. Primary, secondary. Yeah. Like this that. is so interesting because, we're, we're, you know, the podcast is about learning, yeah. and it seems here that unlearning is really yeah. important. Part That's of right. the process is a whole load of unlearning to do. And also, it, it, you know, because this stuff is so pervasive and we'll come back at you again and again maybe this explains some of the weirder conspiracy theories like the flat earth thing that seems to come yeah. back you know well you know i look at the horizon obviously the world's flat you know it's folk physics i suppose yeah well that's like you know one of the episodes we did was on learning styles and in that yeah. episode you know we explained explored in a huge amount of detail how intuition is a real problem here with learning styles it seems to be sort of true you know that people are either visual or auditory or kinesthetic. It's got some sort of, yeah, that seems right to me, you know, because because kids learn differently. Actual, in actual fact, it's completely and utterly wrong. The evidence suggests that it's another set of variables at play here, more likely to be personality differences. There is no innate essentialist trait that is a learning style at all. It doesn't exist. But intuition, a bit like intuition fooling you that, uh, you know, that the sun goes around the earth, you see it. You make a, you make a quick assumption, but it's wrong. So I think learning theory is full of these false intuitive assumptions. That's one level. But it's also true of learners. So learners, when you... Uh, Karpiki, a whole lot of theories, when they ask learners how they learn best, they're completely delusional, not only about what they think they've learned, but what the best strategy is for learning. <laughs> and, uh, interestingly, Giri has a, a, a good deal of reflection on this notion because he doesn't just reflect on primary and secondary knowledge. 
He reflects also on the notion of motivation and control by this brain, this evolved brain. He says, once you understand the evolved brain as seeking control, so you know, so kids, young kids, for example, have motivational biases towards play and other other kids, which makes it incredibly difficult to get them to sit down and do mathematics. <laughs> you know, and that's why a lot of people say don't do maths and even reading with them until they're about age seven. But of course, in this country, we're yeah. absolutely obsessed by getting kids to do things almost at nursery school level. And of course, people like Pinker and others say this is ridiculous because the evolved brain, you're just you're almost destroying motivation by turning kids off from these things at too early an age. You know, desperately reading to your kid every night from age two <laughs> in the hope that they'll read when they're four. Mm. It doesn't really help because people in Finland and Sweden who don't start reading till seven read just as well as your kids. So I think there are uh, there's a lot of mythology and learning theory and in the general population around this confusion of primary and secondary learning. Stephen Arthur Pinker, born 1954, is a Montreal-born cognitive psychologist, psycholinguist, popular science author and public intellectual. He studied at Dawson College, McGill and Harvard and is currently the Johnstone Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard University. Pinker is an advocate of evolutionary psychology and the computational theory of mind. Very well known. He is also the author, among many justly celebrated works, of a 2011 book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And if you ever find, dear listener, that the accumulated effect, accumulated affect, I should say, of appalling and worrisome news headlines causes you to despair of the human race, if you find yourself, as I occasionally do of a morning, shaking your head and karaokeing into your cornflakes the words of that extremely gloomy nick cave song people they ain't no good well this is something someone you ought to know of if you don't already because the better angels of our na nature proves through data and a compelling amount of historical evidence that though we might not think it the human race is becoming less murderous less violent less disgusting and horrible over time personally i'm glad to know this but it has led to Pinker's being portrayed in some quarters as a sort of Dr. Pangloss for the age. The reference being, of course, to the tutor of Condide in Voltaire's novel of the same name, who insists throughout, despite all evidence to the contrary, that we are in fact living in the best of all possible worlds. Donald, I'm glad I got that off my chest, but it's not really relevant. It's not, no, no. It's not at all why we have Dr. Pinker on the list today. So please restore our focus. No, in a sense, I think it's entirely relevant. You know, Pinker, like Darwin, is a scientist, an empiricist, and it's not what Pinker thinks, it's what the research says. And Pinker is, you know, arguably has the, the chair at Harvard, maybe the, the most best known, but also one of the you know most important academics in psychology alive. Uh, and he's an evolutionary psychologist, which is why he's here. He absolutely <laughs> believes that the brain is an evolved organ and that evolutionary psychology is, has huge explanatory power. And his, his most famous book, perhaps, is The Blank Slate, which is an argument against Locke's tabla rasa. So that's important. But uh, his, all of his writings are about the structures of the brain, the language instinct being perhaps the most famous, but others as well, how the mind works, about how the structures of the brain determine how we think and determine psychology and cognition. Okay. Now, to touch on your Panglossian thing for a moment, I think the reason he gets this reputation is he's written a book called Enlightenment Now. He's an Enlightenment thinker and yeah. he's written books on violence, progress, the importance of reason and so on. Uh, but he's entirely in that. And that, that's what came out of the Enlightenment on the scientific route. Other things like Marxism and all sorts of other things we'll discuss. Indeed, evolutionary theorists come out of, uh, come out of Enlightenment thinking as well, or the, the pursuit of science, which is what Darwin did. But to come down to Pinker very specifically, Evolutionary psychology, he's a Chomskyan. He believes that language, we are born with the ability to learn our first language, the point you made at the beginning, John, mm -hmm. quite rightly. And, and it, this doesn't happen by accident. You know, we have evolved now to learn language. The brain seems to have the capacity to pick it up very quickly so that we're grammatical geniuses by age three. This, was, this is a bit of a puzzle because there's not enough data hitting us uh, from our parents or limited environment or siblings to make that possible. So there must be something else at work here. 
And of course, Chomsky thought there was a deeper structures in the brain, as does Pinker, and has written several books on the subject. But this has a massive impact when you're teaching and learning, because I think they're right. <laughs> Myself, a lot of people would disagree here. So he, he's in The Language Instinct, which is, I think, the book that's most relevant to people in the learning world. And the, he the really he demolishes some of the old myths, a bit like the learning style stuff, which he has no time for either, of course. The idea that grammar, for example, needs to be taught in schools, he thinks is plainly ridiculous uh, because it doesn't actually help you speak or write better, to be honest. It, it, it's already a given. It's part of the way we deal with language. And also this idea that uh, there are some people who are better and worse, you know, that I, because I have an accent and don't speak the Queen's English like most of the people in the Southeast are somehow... Uh, you know, less eloquent. He said, this is plainly ridiculous. That's just not how language works. In fact, language has an evolutionary process in itself, which produces variation and diversity and evolves and is a fluid thing. So he's dead against those people saying, oh, I hate this new, I hate the way this word is now used in modern parlance. When, you know, when the real meaning, as we, as I'll show you when we look at the Oxford English Dictionary, of course, <laughs> the Oxford English Dictionary only takes words from usage usually no. past usage. It's not the source of all knowledge on meaning. It's the other way around. Usage, how we use words in the real world is the source of meaning. So the, you know, we get this idiotic, uh, you know, letter to the times type people complaining about the use of language. Oxford when commas and... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's written a whole book on this, so how all these all these notions of style, like the split infinitive and so on, are just plainly ridiculous. It actually came out, uh, it actually came out of the 19th century... A obsession with Latin. People were so desperate to teach Latin that they started taking rules of grammar for Latin and imposing them upon English, stupidly. Mm. And another big one, which you commonly, I think we discussed this in one of the podcasts, is the, oh yeah, on the one on the motion we discussed, it, I think, is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, then the idea that language itself shapes how we think. And that's a really common assumption amongst people that we're bound by a language, that language, you know, Eskimos have 300 words for snow, which they happen not to have. Mm. So, so he scotches that myth as well. So that's one thing. He thinks that language is much closer to a basic instinct, hence the title of the book, Language Instinct. What, what does that mean? Well, it has big implications for our children. And... I mean, he argues that the whole language, so the first several decades in this country and almost globally, still really strong in America, whole language teaching was the paradigm. In other words, you just expose kids to loads of books or you teach the whole word, the whole sentence, uh, uh, and somehow they will magically pick up reading and writing. This does not happen, in fact. And the whole language thing led to a mass, had a massive negative impact on education. Uh, because the wrong teaching methods were used because we didn't realize that actually phonics, because language is an instinct and reading is not, <laughs> or writing is not, that uh, you actually have to, you ha to teach language well, or a second language, for example, you, ha you actually have to start going into the phonetic side, but to teach reading, very specifically yeah. reading, the D you know, decoding those letters that appear weirdly on a page. I mean, you know, when you pick open a, you open a book in Russian, it's just gobbledygook. That's what it's like for a child. How do you actually get them to read? Well, you don't just let them read and read and read or teach them words one by one. You actually do the phonetic thing and break it down so they have the tools to read better. This okay, was so if we go back to one of our previous, we, we were talking about things that are easy to learn, things that are hard to learn, language easy to learn, Reading hard to learn. Exactly. Gary oh. is right. Pinker is right. And yet the, the clouds clear. Yeah, exactly. That's the excellent summary there because, you know, language, language both speaking and hearing or understanding is falling off a log. You don't really mm -hmm. learn that at school. Reading and writing, damn right we have to learn it from school or from a tutor or from a parent. You know, it's a lot of hard work, years of hard work. It takes years to learn to read and write. Mm -hmm. So it's not an instinct. And this is often, this is why we went so badly wrong here. We had the, a sort of social constructive view of the world that the mind is a blank slate. And if we just get kids to just look at words, whole words, it, it will magically emerge. This is just extremely foolish and stupid and it, and it didn't work. So we now know what does work. But still you have resistance to this from people who believe that, you know, as long as I take my kids to a library every day, they're going to learn to read. Well, no, so they have to be taught to read. 
another, another really interesting feature in the way in which evolutionary psychology and Pinker and Darwin have explanatory power is a big modern debate about whether language can be re-engineered through political and social change. So you've had this massive debate around pronouns, for example, which is interesting. So Pinker is on one side of the fence there. He thinks that it doesn't, th he absolutely, like every linguist, thinks that language changes. All languages change. They evolve. You have semantic shift. We know this, this stuff really well. It's been well researched. Absolutely true that language shifts constantly as it goes forwards mm. and is influenced by other languages and immigrants and all sorts of things. However, when you deliberately try and change language, you try and so almost legislate it or impose, that's incredibly difficult. Now, it can be done because we have certain words that are now, you know, illegal uh, or, uh, or, you know, become socially unacceptable. Or deprecated, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's right, and Pinker's fine with that. He says that's no problem, but it's actually only, he, he says, you have to understand linguistics. Remember, he is a psycholinguist. Linguistics is his yeah. game. He says that those words are okay. You can change nouns, by and large, and adjectives. You can get away with that, you know. But, but changing the other words, so there's a, a class of words in linguistics called closed class terms. And those are terms that are more deeply embedded in the grammar of a language. And because they're closed, they're called closed, and pronouns is a good example of that, you can't actually change them very easily because usage just comes back and hits you again. You know, actual people just don't use these words. Mm -hmm. A small group or pool of people can use them effectively, but that's like speaking Esperanto or something. You know, it's like you can learn to do that. That's fine. But social engineering doesn't work with closed terms. So his argument is that in this area is that, I mean, there's no harm in people using any pronouns they want for themselves or other people, but they mm -hmm. cannot expect it to become common usage. He thinks that just will not happen and does not, it just never happens. So highly frequent, widely used, unlikely to use words like pronouns are, are, are just too difficult to change. Just to interrupt though, doesn't that come back to that thing of some things are easy to learn, some things are hard to learn, but the things that are hard to learn aren't necessarily the things we're not going to bother with. Yeah. Um, well, and as, a, as the father of a, a trans daughter, um, yeah. I can attest for the cognitive difficulty of going that way with with pronouns pronouns because it does become extremely difficult but just because something's difficult doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't do it sure. well it's not that, uh, oh yeah no the, no that's true just because it's difficult doesn't mean you should do it so it's, it's difficult to learn mathematics that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't learn mathematics but language is slightly different because mm. language is not as, not as people sometimes imagine in linguistics it's not the ideation of personal ideas it's actually a communications tool Chomsky goes on about this. Every lecture he gives in language, he says it's not, it's about communication. And communication means that language is determined by a community of users. Usage is primary, as it were. And so it's not something that uh, you start, you can just change overnight and legislate for and impose on other people. It's how they actually use the words that determine what language is. So it's not that it's difficult, but it's made doubly difficult because a, because it's a small number of people, a very tiny, you know, less, a tiny percentage of a percentage. So it never gets that momentum that you need in linguistics to make it sink in as normal usage. I think I can, that's helping me to understand it because I had a problem with this sort of, um, this, this thing of pink. Cause, but one thing he said I thought was very sensible was, um, I heard him talking about ages ago, was contrasting the French attitude to dictionaries and language and the English attitude. The English attitude has been much more about studying and following usage, yeah. whereas the French, the Académie Française is there to kind of lay down rules that, you know, subsequently nobody ever followed. And I, I can see what he's getting at there. Yeah, I mean, the, the and you can see why that would be true. In fr so fr the French language has two genders. I mean, for, for almost everything in the world, for everything in the world, which is, you know, to a sort of... And the German language has three. Three, which, yeah. Which is the, interesting. I, I, yeah. I have a friend who's uh, non-binary and is German, yeah. but she wants us to use the she pronoun because of her experience with the German language and the neuter is... Yeah not well, useful yeah. as a as a kind of proxy for describing it, it it's a minefield it's very difficult yeah. and i can see you're explaining why it's just so difficult but we can't yeah. just say you should do it like this it has to be a communal change in society to do it 
Well, I mean, that, that, that's how ridiculous, but that, you know, recommendation you use, use the new term is slightly ridiculous, really. You know, it's not how the German works. Really. Well, that's how she says, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and then, I mean, if, if you want to go down that route, you say, well, you know, we should be, it's the ninja slippery slope here. We should be banning the, the masculine and feminine in the French language because if all genders are fluid and so on, you know, that makes no sense at all. And actually, in fact, that binary split is downright evil in the eyes of, of people. So, but because, of course, there are other reasons why linguistically that type of gender thing got embedded in French and why the three classifications, right, they're not really gender classifications at all, to be honest, but, you know, it's not, they're not based on sexual, they're no longer got anything to do with the sexual side of things or, or gender versus biological sex. Yeah. So, but you're right, it's a, it's a minefield politically, but I think it's quite clear linguistically, you know, what's going on here. I think there's been enough good high-end, a, a linguist like Pinker, who have, for me personally, I think, managed to unwrap this somewhat. And, okay. you know, Pinker is a liberal guy. He's definitely not against any of this stuff. Uh, and he's quite happy for people to use and use language as they will. But he's, he's he said, get real. You're not going to impose this on other people who don't use those words. And yeah. because it's just not going to happen, you know, that it, it's almost a scientific fact for those linguists. So let's move on now from this um Slightly troublesome area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's worth pointing out actually that uh, I think Geary, um, one of his main interests is in sex differences. Which yes, is, it is. Yeah. I mean, there. But as I say, we'll, we'll move along. <laughs> Time to sum up. Um, so I think you've told us a story today about the centrality of learning to our genesis and survival as a species. I, you know, personally, it's been really interesting for me to, to, to learn about this today from you, Donald. Any teacher or head of learning who feels aggrieved at the lack of importance that might seem to be attached to what they do by their institution or their government will be heartened by this or perhaps further enraged. But on a more mundane level, do these insights give us a pointer, give us any pointers about how we ought to go about structuring and designing learning? Sorry to keep bringing it down to that, but we do like to do we're offering practical advice. Well, that's right. So, so far, I think we have this distinction between primary and secondary learning. If you take that, and you have to be a bit careful with this as well, it's not as clear cut as you might imagine. In mathematics, for example, yeah. we have our primary ability, uh, with numeracy, uh, uh, as it were, you know, uh, universally, we have the ability to count up a few things, you know. Uh, how does that get turned into calculus? <laughs> how does that happen? And of course, what you have to do is depend upon the primary or primary evolved ability to deal with numbers. And then set, build upon that, you know, and go very carefully. I've taught mathematics, you know, to go very carefully from basic numbers, one, two, three, four, then zero is a bit of a, you know, and ch children have no concept of zero. You have to teach them that, then negative numbers, then addition, take it very slowly, then subtraction. You can take these numbers away. And then you go on, then only then can you go on to division and multiplication and on and on and on. So you can build secondary learning on the basis of primary learning if you know what good primary learning is. And that's how it always should be done. The same is true of physics and biology and science in general. It's a good rule. And of course, if only we had listened to the people like Pinker, we would not have had decades of whole language speaking. We would have stuck to phonics, which is what he was recommending, but we didn't. Uh, because we believed in social constructivism, that the mind was a blank slate, you just write things upon it, which is plainly ridiculous in my view. So there's, a, I think it, inform, it informs us how to move from primary to secondary learning or to build upon the given primary learning to make secondary learning more effective. And we've, we've given several examples like reading and writing and so on throughout this and also science throughout this podcast. There are other wider things, John, I think, from other evolutionary psychologists, if you want to call them that here, the, you know, we're talking about evolution in general. So oh. as some people know, like Robin DeBar has become very famous. He uh, is an American, uh, Robin DeBar is not an American, he's at the University of Oxford. And he came up with Dunbar's number that a lot of people oh, know. the Dunbar about. number, yeah. Yeah, this, the social group of 150, you know. So you group companies in 150 or you're, if you're doing social learning, for example, you might be very careful with making your cohorts too large because we, our brains have not evolved to deal with social groups greater than a certain number. It's so actually that 150 number is a bit misleading because actually the real number for optimal teams is down at four and five. 
pure, if you have conversational teams. So, right. and that again is an evolved thing, you know, a uh, little hunting groups tend to be very small. The more people you have, the less likely you are to catch something. Yeah. Or, we're not a herd animal. We're a pack animal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's true in the animal kingdom as well. When you get pack six lions and so on and so forth. So, Robin DeMar is a good example of an evolutionary psychologist who has actually, and is often quoted by social learning theorists, but they, they sort of conveniently forget that he is actually an evolutionary psychologist and who came up with this. That, so his notion that there's a cognitive limit to the number of individuals you can deal with, uh, any one person can maintain stable relationships or friendships with, is, has become quite famous. Uh, but that's the result of our evolutionary past. Uh, you have... I mean, there are many others that, uh, you know, are relevant, I think, to, to the learning theory. There's a, a, at uh, a Vrije University, or VU University in Holland, we have Mark, Mark, Mark van Vucht, if that's the correct pronunciation, V-U-G-D-G-T. He applies evolutionary psychology to sort of leadership and business skills, you know, organizational yeah. and social psychology, which is interesting. You know, the notion of leaders and followers or altruism, group dynamics, business, all that stuff. I think he's, his stuff is really interesting in bringing a fruitful evolutionary psychology perspective to that. I, so, you know, once you, dig, once you go down uh, the evolutionary psychology route, you find that there are people who are already in common culture are already coming up with theories that we use. We just forget that it's come from Darwin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, with people like Robert Kurzban, who's, his, his focus is on human social behavior. In other words, evolution explains how we interact with other people in social groups. That's the primary explanatory power. It was also true of Judith Harris, who we covered in the previous podcast. Yep. She thinks that peer groups in education are incredibly important. Not parents. Parents have hardly any influence over their child. And of course, once you've had a troublesome teenager, you know exactly what Judith Harris is talking about. Kids are evol have evolved, the, the mind has evolved to almost flee the nest at about 14, 15, 16 to disassociate from parents and associate with peer groups. That's exactly what happens to every teenager in the history of our species. <laughs> and uh, of course, it comes as a puzzle to parents who think that the mind is just a blank slate. And if only I tell them to do their homework every night, they're going to do it, which they never do. So we have social behavior being explained by Kurzan and others, uh, people like, people like uh, uh, Robert Trivers. He looks at this very specifically, at parental investment reciprocal altruism and others. How is it that we can be nice to other people? Why is that so? Well, there's, it's actually quite a good evolutionary trait to have a communal altruism because you scratch my back, I scratch yours. It actually happens to be a pretty good rule in life, <laughs> uh, as we all know. So and this goes on and on. And there's, there's a, an Irish psycholo evolutionary psychologist I really like as well called Victor Johnson. And he, he goes right into cognitive psychology uh, right down to the cognitive engineering, biopsychology type stuff. And this all emerges into AI, of course. Another guy I like is Jeffrey Miller, the mating mind. He focuses on sexual selection. Mm -hmm. And he has written a great book called Spend, which is, we've talked about this, I think, with Baudrillard and consumerism. Why are we so obsessed by the Apple phone or, you know, or uh, Gucci handbags or whatever. And the book yeah. Spend is all about our evolutionary past. In other words, status really matters. Status really matters. And boy, is that true. I mean, it's just clear as, clear as day in the world of consumerism that the, the things you buy, the clothes you wear, the brands you're associated with, this is all evolutionary driven. It's not a rational thing at all. We're just these dumb, stupid apes that like to show off. <laughs> yes. And it's a great book, Spend. His, his real book, The Mating Mind, is, is a serious, 2003 book, is a serious book about sexual selection and so on. Yeah. So they're all, they're all panoply of people. It opens up a whole world for you, this evolutionary. So thing. if listeners have been particularly interested by this topic, there's plenty of them to follow up on. So Donald, our status is now that we're at the end of our allotted time slot. Um, after this, Perhaps we all feel like rather less dumb, less stupid apes, um, although we have a, a keen perception of how our dumb, stupid apeness still continues to interact with our desire to learn and learn more. And anybody who wants to learn more about learning, keep tuning in to Great Minds on Learning. Thanks a lot, Donald, for that. Thank you.
Thank you very much, John. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. Graphics by David O'Connor. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and we'd like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. Next time, Donald and John explore the power of play with an episode on games and gamification in learning. Join us, won't you? And here are a few extra minutes from that discussion as a bonus. Our status as an ape, which is what Darwin, uh, you know, really said, is quite interesting. So in 2017, I found myself in Rwanda, halfway up the side of a volcano, having exhausted myself in the middle of a group of gorillas by accident, because we were meant to keep 20 meters away from them. And it was a fascinating example of two evolved species facing off each other. There I was, I could literally touch the back of the silverback. And his uh, his family kin were all around him, and he wasn't bothered. He was. It was a beautiful sight in this green jungle. They were eating bamboo. They were, you know, what a setting! Absolute. The tranquility of the thing was amazing. And there we were, human beings, decked out with cameras and smartphones and cl- ugly clothes and shoes and socks. Who's the stupid ape here? You know, he's something. <laughs> Wow, you know, I'm I'm looking at this magnificent creature in his natural habitat. Actually, I stood up to take a picture with my SLR camera, stood in a piece of bamboo, and one of the females hit me on the chest because I stepped on her lunch, and quite rightly so. But it was, you know, I really came face to face with that notion of, you know, what are we here really? How we are we the stupid ape? You know, we're destroying the planet. We're the people who are causing havoc. Uh, you know, who, you know what has evolution produced here? And this is what Darwin said. You said earlier, there is no primitive and sophisticated here. There's no primitive and advanced. Uh, we have to recognize the fact that we're here with every other species and uh, we have to be sensitive to that.